and uh, uh, welcome all and uh, before i start uh, it's my uh, immense pleasure that i'm able to do this uh, following up my guru so professor roy was uh, my phd supervisor and uh, still he keeps on advising me whenever i reach out to him for a lot of matters and most of these advices were possibly related to life and beyond uh, anything on technical part of it but whatever i got uh, on to over here and all of this interest on this crazy uh, point of doing deep learning and uh, trying to do it on medical imaging itself and not image analysis as such is uh, something uh, i owe as an immense reverence to professor roy without him it wouldn't have been possible and this makes it really special that uh, I, i took it as a very pleasure surprise uh, of uh, hearing him when i just logged into the platform so this is going quite good and uh, without much of an ado i would uh, start with the presentation now now you would be seeing uh, this one particular slide on which you see two images and then i have a short quiz for all of you so uh, based on uh, whatever you understand of this one so one of these uh, images is actually from an ultrasound machine and the other one is something which is not taken from an ultrasound machine it's actually generated by an algorithm so the question over here is that uh, you can write down on the chat room over here if you believe that the left one is the real or if you support that the right one is the real you can just write it down so this is just a small quiz to have an understanding about the audience and uh, that opens up the actual area on which i would be work discussing much more about where we are going and uh, while professor roy had actually put down a good context over here that things had started much more uh, naive but today we have much more advanced developments and we are trying to answer some questions which are not uh, so trivial uh, seemingly so this is one of those very non trivial uh, questions which we are trying to address and uh, how can you make uh, machines synthesize images which look very real okay so i see a lot of people voting in favor of the right so if if anybody of you were actually from any of my previous uh, uh, lectures on a similar thing and had seen this kind of images and you thought that that the answer was right so you are still putting it down as right then i can assure you that the pair of images has changed I actually have uh, 40 real images and 40 paired simulated images, which makes it that I can create uh, 1,600 combinations of left and right out of it. Okay, so uh, if some of you can say, like, what made you think that the right one is real? Okay, I have an interesting both are synthetic. So on on the both are synthetic thing, I can assure you that one of them is real. So any reason why why you thought that the right one is real? or those of you who voted that the left one is real any reason why you thought that the left one is real Okay. Okay. So now let me show you. On the right one, you saw that kind of a split in the twelve o'clock position, which is exactly in the middle up. Uh, if you look on the one on the left and look into the three o'clock position, you would see a similar kind of a cut line. Uh, 
and uh, for the other part where if you say that on the right one at least in the middle part where the lumen is present you see much richer textures so the understanding is that's possibly real i can assure you that uh, take a screenshot most most likely what you are experiencing is a visual anomaly and some sort of a refractive error uh, when trying to look into a screen which might be bigger or or something of that sort so what you can do is take a screenshot then just do a left right flipping and a mirroring and uh, look at it and you would see that uh, the one which is on the left when it comes on the right you would see that that becomes much more richer in textures so let's uh, get into the actual one what i wanted to discuss so today uh, i'm more focused into uh, discussing out on the introduction to mathematics of deep learning and uh, i'm going to focus on a couple of these points which i have written over here but then uh, just to give out as a disclaimer that uh, mathematics of deep learning is a much uh, deeper subject and course we typically do it as uh, workshops which take uh, close to 35 to 40 hours of instructioning so about 35 hours of 35 instructional hours worth of material so it's a, it's really hard to uh, cover everything in a short duration so what i'm going to do is we had made an attempt uh, along with a couple of colleagues who work on this area to bring it down to a smaller one and uh, still that one was 3 hours so somehow i tried to figure out how to get it fixed into one and a half hour so there might be places where i would be rushing through and uh, please bear with me and um, if you are not able to get a certain part then please uh, raise your hand or write it down on the chat box if you want to intervene i i have pretty much split screen so i can see your chat box as well so let's get into it now uh, at the outset uh, the whole work which i'm presenting is heavily uh, supported and sponsored by a lot of agencies who have been uh, working and supporting our research group for uh, a lot of outcomes and uh, without them it would really not have been possible so this is a uh, disclaimer on uh, all the conflicts and interests which i have and it's it's significantly large actually so let's get to the basic point one is uh, learning now essentially if you look into it and as tom mitchell defines it the primary point is that uh, he starts with a computer program but you can replace a computer program with a human being as well and that also works out pretty good uh, without much of an issue so it said that a computer program is said to learn uh, with respect to a certain experience e uh, when performing a certain class of tasks called as t and you and you measure all of this uh, performance with respect to a certain measure called as p so it's said to learn only when you see that when it is performing this task more and more and you are trying to measure the uh, some sort of a metric of how good is it in performing that particular task by a certain measure called as p you would see that the value of p will keep on improving with experience e so if p is something like accuracy then value of p would be increasing as you have more and more experience if uh, p is something like error then as experience keeps on increasing then the value of p will decreasing so it will be improving that's essentially what we want to see over here so this is crux so any kind of a learning problem essentially will have these particular things which you need to consider one is that there has to be a certain task next is there has to be some experience gain and that is what we call as learning data or whatever is in your data set your training part everything is that you have something called as a measurement of how good is it at uh, doing a certain task and that performance measure p is something which we also call as a loss function or a cost function and experience is the whole part of training over here so you keep on training over more and more epochs and you have more experience going down over here and that's the whole experience part which comes down to play so now uh, let's get into what's the basic from where we start so the primary point is uh, base rule and for any kind of a decision problem this is from where everything starts so if you remember from base rule as as we knew from our uh, plus 2 level mathematics uh, where we first got introduced to all of this and then there were those interesting problems of rolling of a dice and um, some card games and tossing of coins and sometimes it would be like you toss a coin and then you roll a die what is the chance that you will get a tail and uh, the number 5 on the face of the die these these kind of questions which we used to get and we used to make use of these bayes uh, rule in order to solve a lot of those problems now if you break down this bayes rule then uh, it can be broken down into another simplified form over here and they have different names 
Now, what you have on the right hand side is what is called as a posterior probability. Now, here, in terms of very plain Jane definition, what it would mean is that if omega is a class label or essentially certain kind of a decision which I want to have, and x is an input or what we also call as a feature associated with the sample, then the point is that uh, the posterior probability is going to give you a value between the range of 0 to 1, which says that what is the probability that I can get a certain output or a class label given that I'm seeing a certain kind of an input or features over here. Now that essentially can be derived from one factor which is called as likelihood. And if you see that the conditionings are basically reversed in case of likelihood. So the like conditioning of a likelihood is that what is the probability of getting a certain feature given that you know it is from a certain class over there. Similarly, the other part is what is called as a prior probability and that is uh, essentially what is the probability of finding a certain class. And then you have the denominator which is called as an evidence which is what is the probability that you would in fact uh, encounter a certain uh, feature which is like that. So what this is going to give you is uh, clearly a rational way in which uh, if I know a certain part of things based on something which has historically occurred, uh, then can I make a prediction about what is going to happen in the future. And some things which are very critical over here is that if a feature never occurs to you, then it would essentially have an evidence of zero. Okay, so an evidence of zero is something like uh, the sun rises in the west. So at least on planet Earth, the sun does not, you don't see the sun rising on the west. That's why your evidence of that one is zero over there. So now if uh, there are anything which you say, so often you would say that uh, like people sarcastically remark that this is possible only if the sun rises in the west. So you know that this is possible only if sun rises in the west, if that is the condition given, then your evidence of the sun rising in the west anyways is zero. So whatever be your likelihood and prior probability, your posterior probability over there will become some value which is unsolvable. So just a number divided by zero, which is essentially not a solvable parameter. If you say that the probability is tending towards zero, then you can still say that uh, if evidence is, tend is a value of probability tending towards zero, your posterior probability is tending towards infinity. But if it is exactly zero, then you don't have anything. So it's an unsolvable case which becomes over here. So that's sort of like a small joke around the whole point of um, sun rising in the west and the mathematical correlation with uh, evidence. Now, if we go from there and I want to solve a certain interesting problem which I have over here. So what you see on the right hand side on the screen is a bunch of cows and cars. Okay, now uh, these cows and cars and you have two different measurements on the axis. One is called as X1, another is X2. X1 is what I call as shade of color of the particular object and X2 is what I call as length of the object which we are seeing over here. Now the point is that uh, what I want you to do is use this base rule and somehow based on an experimental data which you have, which now we will start calling as a uh, training set, can you give me the posterior probability of encountering either a cow or a car if I give you this combination of x1, x2 or I tell you what is the length of the object which we have encountered and what is the shade of color of the object which we have encountered, can you tell me what is the type of object we encountered, whether we encountered a cow or whether we encountered a car in this particular problem. So what do you think you can do? Can you start with this particular data which is given down over here? You can put your uh, thoughts on the chat box and let's keep it interactive otherwise it pretty much gets boring and I hate unilateral dialogue deliveries. No, okay. Let's see, I, I, I can pretty much see that uh, there are more than 99. It shows 99 plus 2, so 101 people on this meeting. Um, so essentially, if I'm not getting that many responses or even 50% of the responses, then most of the people are not able to understand. Then my point becomes like, why am I speaking even over here? If you haven't Sir, got the question, write it down. Chat is disabled. Sir, chat, the chat is disabled. Chat is disabled, so maybe the actually they are uh, actually they are written administrator disabled the chat. Administrator, administrator disabled the, the chat. 
So I would just request the administrator if you can enable that for everybody. That would make it nice. Hello. Some people are able to write as I see. Sir, only guest can uh, send the message, sir, in the chat box, not the participant. That's a bit weird. I mean, generally everybody is supposed to have it. So, oh, oh, if no chat is, uh, yeah. So I see that chat is enabled. That is what people are saying because people are writing down on the chat. So if you are maybe if you are joining from a phone app or uh, on the web, it it might be creating a problem. Ah, okay. It's available only on the desktop versions and not on the mobile. <laughs> Got it. That was an interesting insight. Uh, teams, the Microsoft Teams team, product team is anyways working on this one because we also use this one and uh, there are a lot of feedbacks and I'm one of those very vocal feedback giving guys that I don't see this one and I need that. Uh, okay, anyways. Let's get back to our problem. The problem was not with enabling or disabling chat and features on mobile phones for Microsoft Teams. Their product team can get used to it. I'm not getting paid for doing that. The thing uh, which is on the agenda is, do you think with the data which is given over here, can you solve this problem? So now, uh, some people say yes, some people say no, and uh, some have understood the concept. So let's let's get into it. So for people who have said yes, I my question was like how, uh, but nobody got back on that by using feature feature recognition. You are already given features. You are given X1 and X2. They are the two features. That's it. You don't get images. You get only features X1 and X2. You can solve the problem. Okay, good. So let's get into it. Like how we will start with solving the problem. So, uh, like once you are able to solve that problem, I'm, I'm coming down to mathematically how we will do. We'll get into the whole mathematics. But once you are able to solve this problem, you will be able to get something which is called as a maximum is posterior probability, and uh, that will lead to creating something called as a decision boundary. And what this would mean is that any feature value which is above this line would essentially belong to a car. So here, this one is above it. Here, this one is above it. This one is above it. And any feature value which is below this line is essentially what is going to be a cow. That's very straightforward and simple. That's that's what we are going to do. And that is what is called as a decision boundary over. Okay, great. We are able to solve it up. Now the problem is that there is a lot of challenge which is associated with this decision boundary. Now, first and foremost is if you have a lot of samples. Okay. I have a lot of samples. And then I can pretty much do a decision boundary, which says that okay, anything on on the left hand side is what belongs to the orange process, and anything on the right hand side is what belongs to the red surface, and that's great. I'm able to solve it out. The problem starts coming in when you don't have so many abundant samples. So one possible solution is this, which works out good, and then we are happy around it. But then there is also a possibility that this can also be a solution, and that's where the problem starts coming in. So between this and this. Because the order of the nature of the curve is changing, so essentially your order of equation which is defining that curve is also changing. So if you have a straight line, then you know that it's it's essentially x2 is equal to uh, m into x1 plus c. So and you have two different variables, m and c, which are the free parameters, and based on value of m and c, you have a different line which will come down over here, which is essentially going to be your decision boundary. But when you have something like a quadratic surface, you have one number of variables which will come down over there, and that makes it complicated. So now from there, in fact, this is just not the simplest of the point. The bigger challenge will come down when you have really scarce samples. So when you have really scarce samples, then what happens out is that one of the possible solutions is that straight line, which works out. But then any parallel straight line to that one is also a possible solution. Anything which is not parallel but skewed now is also a solution and anything of this sort is also a solution. Now if you look into all of these possible solutions, the challenge which comes out is that you don't have a unique way of solving it. All. So at least in the first case when you have abundant samples, you are very clear what is the order of my equation and what is going to be the exact parameter which will fit into my equation. When I got into the middle case, which is not so much abundant sample, then I was confused more of between the order of the equation. But if I am able to 
more or less narrow down to the order of the equation then i can find out like what is the free parameter to define that equation and when i come on to the right hand side which is the extreme case it comes down to the fact that i can actually have lot of order of equations and i can also have lot of solutions to each particular order of an equation okay now i have one question which is what if the samples cloud the original sample for checking the decision boundary so that's that's pretty much possible i'm, I'm i will be actually coming down to that part of it on uh, the sample clouding around each original sample in order to check for the decision boundary there is a certain term which we use for that and that's one of the possible solutions which we use over here but let's understand the problem first so this is one part of the issue now if you want to understand this challenge deeper then we'll have to get into a deep diving part of it one is that this was the source equation which we were using in order to uh, do all of our solution what this would mean is that your decision boundary which was basically an r max thing is going to have a certain topology so now the topology of that is guided by the order of equation so if i have a order one equation which is y is equal to mx plus c a straight line condition i have two variables then it becomes a straight line and there is no influx there, there is no zero crossing or there is no change in curvature which happens over if i have something like this that there are twice there is a change in curvature then this essentially means that this line follows a cubic equation right this line follows a cubic equation that would mean that my posterior probability also follows a cubic equation now the posterior probability is not something which pops out out of randomness the posterior probability is something which is dependent on the likelihood it's dependent on the um, prior probability and it's dependent on the evidence plus you know that the evidence is also something which is dependent on the likelihood and the prior probability over here so what that would essentially mean is that if your posterior probability or or this decision boundary is a cubic order function then your likelihood is also a cubic order function okay now that this is a cubic order function the other option which you can have is that you can also consider uh, thinking of having a quadratic equation over here and that would mean that this likelihood becomes a quadratic equation now the other possibility which you will have in this case is that a linear equation also can do a fit it's more or less like straight forward if you are assuming that these are point sources uh, these are extended icons which i have drawn so it looks like they are just grazing around the border but otherwise these are like just uh, touching out over there on the boundary conditions over there and now if i look into all of this and then take the other extremity which is uh, when i have really sparse amount of data then the problem comes down is that you can have a linear equation like this but then uh, there can be lot of combinations of m and c which would lead to a different kind of a combination of these linear equations which come down and that starts creating the problem so if you want to understand this challenge the challenge is in two ways one is that we are not certain and we would like to ascertain what is the order of the equation which creates this decision boundary the second part is that we would like to ascertain what are the values which make up this particular decision boundary over here okay so now that brings us to the whole point of what are the objectives of machine learning now the first point is that you have one part which is your data plane over here so you have all the data which is present over there now if you look into this data plane of the problem then uh, the easiest to solve is something where you have a lot of data the moment you have a lot of data then you have a very definite equation which is to be solved out and and it becomes much more easier to solve the toughest of all of this is essentially when you don't have a very clear demarcation coming out because you have point scattered data uh, everywhere and you can have possibly many solutions which come down so it can be polynomial order of a equation which can happen or uh, even if it's uh, taken down as a linear or anything then you can have more than one solution because the free variables can take in any value which can come down over here okay so now the problem which comes down is that here the easiest of the problems which you would ever get to solve is the one where you have abundant data wherever you don't have abundant data it it's not so easy to uh, get it solved the next part is where you need to look into the model selection part of it now here comes this whole thing that if you have a linear model then it is the easiest to solve because you have just have to free parameters to solve whereas if you go to quadratic then let's count out the number of parameters so it will be something like uh, a x1 square plus b x2 square plus c x1 x2 
प्लस डी एक्स वन प्लस ई एक्स टू प्लस अ कॉन्स्टेंट सो देर आर सिक्स डिफरेंट फ्री पैरामीटर्स विच यू विल हैव इन अ फुल फ्लेजेड क्वाड्रेटिक इक्वेशन विच विल नॉट जस्ट कंसिस्ट ऑफ द स्क्वायर टर्म्स एंड द कॉन्स्टेंट टर्म बट इट विल हैव स्क्वायर टर्म्स इट विल हैव लीनियर टर्म्स इट विल और लाइक इट विल हैव ऑर्डर टू ऑर्डर वन एंड ऑर्डर जीरो all terms considered over there similarly if you go to cubic getting it becomes 16 or something of that sort and that increases the problem because the number of free parameters you have the more number of possible e unique equations you will have to define and that many number of solutions you will have to obtain over there now from there if i go to the next part which is what is called as a control plane of the problem and in the control plane the point is what kind of cost functions and optimizers are you going to use now in earlier days when you were just doing it with base uh, equation and base model of solving it out the best way was just to do a maximum likelihood estimation and ml and it would solve it out from there we came down to some sort of regression fitting and all of these curve fitting kind of problems and they were based on mean square error and from there we came on to this whole thing of what today the world looks into is what is called as a perception loss and in fact if you look into the order of complexity perception loss modeling is really complicated because most of the time we don't even know how to define perception so in fact i will give you an example of where we get really lost in trying to define what is perception now what that brings us to the point is that if we are able to solve it we will be able to solve a lot of real world problems so one of those examples is what i showed you in the first slide itself when we quizzed around which was a real ultrasound image versus which was not a real ultrasound image but was a simulated ultrasound so that's something which we were able to solve only because we broke the code of how you can model a perception loss within a mathematical paradigm and then like how do humans perceive as something being real and can we really have a cost function which will say the same thing over there but then it's not such a trivial problem as such okay so let's get into uh, the starting point of one of it so the first problem which you have is the data space uh, of this whole issue now in the data space of the problem you would see that uh, the toughest of it is when uh, you have less very scarce amount of data present over there but then you can actually solve it so one of the ways which you can do is what is called as the whole method of augmentation so this is a clear example of say something which i am trying to do with uh, taking and classifying uh, white blood cells so the whole uh, part over here is that you are given down microscopy images of blood smear and uh, there are certain cells which you are able to see in these images and then you have these wbcs and then the point over here is that i want to actually uh, segment out this uh, classify the wbc i am given down a small patch of this wbc and i have to classify it out so now the question is that uh, how do i really train a classifier if i have less number of samples given down so one thing which we can do is that this wbc if it is rotated is still going to be the same wbc of same class so essentially what that would mean is that you can now have multiple manifestations of the same kind of appearance model created by just rotating it completely in different ways okay so this is one of the ways in which uh, you can do it so one is like you can rotate it out the other is like you can do a flip up down it will still be the same wbc you can on top of it do a flip left right or a mirror inversion and it will still remain the same wbc over there now this together is what we call as the whole art of augmentation and in fact it's called as an art because there is no direct science involved if you are trying to follow down a uh, standard set rule and apply it on all of them then it will not work out the challenge being that say you have a cow and you did this same kind of uh, rotation flip up down flip left right on top of it you might end up getting something like this kind of a cow and if you are doing uh, doing a cow classification with images of cow where your cow is up down then you are training a suboptimal classifier and possibly you are deceiving the whole classifier from getting trained because on the road or on the ground or on the fields how many times have you actually seen a cow like this in the real world until and unless you, your camera was flipped but in that case everything would be flipped up down you will not just have the cow flipped up down so how many times do you think that you have actually seen a cow like this so this this whole brings us to the point of why we need to be very uh, cautious about what kind of augmentation we are applying now from this augmentation point is what i would get back to one of the questions which uh, one of the participants had asked and that was like if you have a cloud of data so essentially what it does is that this kind of a rotation flipping all of this introduces a certain amount of perturbation around these points so if this is a point over here and i flip it up down it may come down over here 
so essentially what i am doing is that there is a small cloud of such points which i am creating or a constellation of a small variation which can happen in the feature space if the original image is itself flipped now uh, this would work out only if you have say rotation and uh, translation scaling invariant uh, varying feature descriptors but then if you have rotation invariant feature descriptor that will not change ideally that is not supposed to change so these will be some things which you need to keep in mind a lot of times what we try to do is that instead of trying to invest a lot on augmenting the data we try to create features and uh, today you have deep neural networks which get made in a way where the deep neural network itself is learning rotation invariant features it's learning scale invariant features and that that way it's it's basically able to bypass this whole problem i don't have an issue around all of this okay so now let me get into uh, the other part of this problem which is on model selection now if you look into this kind of say a uh, network i've just given you a model over here and uh, what you are getting down on this set of learned features is a representation which is like this so the output of the green block is going to give you x1 x2 combinations and this combination for two different classes is something which is uh, located like this now here generally the boundary which you have is essentially something which looks like an ellipse or a quadratic function and that is supposed to be the learned decision which can discriminate between what is the red class and what is the orange uh, cross as the other class okay now the question is that if from here i am able to create some sort of another model by inserting and infusing another small layer inside over there such that i can come down to a very linearly separable margin over here which which makes it much more easier to separate then what i am doing is by putting down additional layers i am able to make the job of the discriminator much more easy so i don't need to have the discriminator anymore as a quadra uh, as a quadratic equation but i can have the discriminator as a linear equation now is another interesting problem uh, question which i will ask you at this point and that is that if i am able to get this kind of a linear line then what kind of a mathematical operation do you think can be employed on the red discriminator which was as an ellipse to come down to this kind of a straight line discriminator you can write your uh, answers on the chat i hope you have got the question so the question is that if i give you this kind of a constant over here and say that the discriminator which was in red has to be converted to the discriminator discriminator as in you see in this learned feature space the red dotted contour which is the decision boundary now this decision boundary i am getting it converted to this red dotted contour uh, decision boundary so what kind of a mathematical operation can i apply so that i can convert this red dotted contour decision boundary to the blue dotted contour decision boundary which is essentially from a quadratic space to a linear space yes you do a non linear but my point is like how how will you convert a quadratic feature representation see there is a conversion in the feature representation and as a result of this feature representation conversion you are able to get a linear boundary so the operation is essentially on the feature space over here so going from uh, the feature space in the left to a feature space on the right what kind of an operation do you think you can employ such that you can achieve no it's it's not linear you are writing down the line equation my question is how will you go from that feature space in the left to the feature space on the right so somebody writes down 2ax plus b no just try to put it down like by doing all of those will you be able to uh, map down uniquely every single point onto one unique point on the right hand side so every point is a unique point and this kind of a mapping is also a one is to one mapping it's a one is to one unique mapping i can guarantee you
Okay, W into X. What is W? Clustering. How do you cluster? So, what is that mathematical transformation? This is very simple. What is the mathematical transformation which you can do for going from the feature space distribution on the left hand side to the feature space distribution on the right hand side? Yes, I got down something. Y is equal to x square, but that is not exactly the way. You like you have only one part of the answer, not not both the parts of the answer. Representing feature space in higher order, no, I can guarantee you that in it's it's a two D feature space to a two D feature feature space. We did not go from a two D to a three D. And you increase from a lower dimensional to a higher dimensional does not necessarily guarantee that you will have a separability in the higher space. Because one additional dimension is is a fictitious thing which you are just putting down over there, that that came in random. It was an infusion which you. Okay, let me let me give you a very simple hint around over here. So, do you re remember something like a um, uh, polar to Cartesian conversion, or people who deep dive a lot into uh, uh, say support vector machines? Do you remember something called as a kernel trick? You guys are really thinking too deep. It's very simple. Find out whatever is the on the left hand side plot. Find out what is the centroid over here. Then along the centroid, keep that centroid fixed in x1 and x2. You find out what is the theta of the vector which is connecting the centroid to that particular feature space, and what is the radius or the distance between that. So essentially, what you are doing is that x1, x2. If you on the left hand side image if you try to put down each of them into a r theta mapping on the right hand side then you would see that it becomes a very separable thing because radius is something which is x1 so all the red dots have red circle dots have a smaller radius they will be on a smaller part of x1 and all the orange crosses will have a larger radius so they will be far apart in x1 And then uh, these are spread pretty much across all of theta or all of these uh, rotational angles. So you would see this uh, quite spreading across this uh, x2 feature over there. It was very simple. You just needed to do a polar to Cartesian conversion. Uh, sorry, a Cartesian to polar conversion, and that solves it all. Now the reason why I was giving you this is deep learning is not that complex. It's actually very simple. The only thing is that we have been fed so much. About understanding that max is complex and uh, machine learning is even more complex, and that was done so that people like me and uh, who make a living out of deep learning and machine learning can still continue making a living. Because if everybody understands, then what is our role over here? Now the question is that it's it's not so complicated. You just have to think in terms of your very elementary mathematics, and I can go on giving you enough number of proofs that beyond. Class 12 level mathematics. Nothing is actually needed in order to do understand and do deep learning. The only time when you will need something beyond it in terms of convolution, correlation, Fourier transform, Laplace transforms, and everything is much more deeper. When you get into some sort of explainability and, and uh, deterministic explainability, understanding about neural networks, and they are much more advanced stages. I mean, today we are still trying to figure out what that essentially means. We all of us don't even have answers to that. So let's get to the next part of the problem, and here I would come into this thing, which is about the control plane. Now over here, the I, I did mention that the easiest of the problems to solve is with uh, maximum likelihood estimation, and the toughest is to do something like a perception loss. Now here, what I'm trying to show you is that what is this perception loss, and then why do you need it? So let's take an example. 
you took a sketch of a dream house which you want to build so how many of you want to build a house how many of you own a house on your own plot and not a flat and uh, you want to build a house you can raise your hand you can type on the chat box yes one person two Three. I have somebody raising hand. Four. Two people have raised their hands. Yeah. So a, a lot of people want to build your houses. Now, when you want to build a house, the first part is like you go and find out a plot, but uh, it's like a chicken and egg problem because you have have to find out what is the size of a plot you want to buy, plot of land. For that, you will have to go first to the civil engineer or the architect and tell them that see, I want to build a house. but i don't know what should be the measurement of the land so what this guy is going to ask you is like until you tell me the measurement of the land i cannot build a house i cannot give you the plan of a house so a starting point may be something like you start imagining like this is what all things i want in my house and make down some plan and uh, i mean we are engineers we can do planning all of us have studied engineering drawing somewhere in the first year so we can work it out but otherwise also you can take a pen and paper and just uh, scratch it up uh somebody says my audio is very low which is uh quite an unlikely thing because it's supposed to have an auto audio adjust just a minute let me check my device settings now it it showing pretty much decent audio quality maybe you just need to up the volume on your side so is the audio quality good for others or uh, is it really bad for everybody okay so i think whoever is not going to i think it's pretty good properly okay so if you have issues with the audio maybe one option is like you can switch off the incoming video which will switch off my webcam feed you don't need to see my face you can still see the slides and uh, just a bandwidth issue can't help it out i can't help it out your service providers and try can actually help it out so tell try that internet quality is very bad so now uh, the point is that you can sketch something and and give it to this guy and then this guy has to uh, make some plans and everything but when you are sketching you might desire that how will it look really in real life so something like uh, can i have a photo out of this sketch now see one thing is one kind of a cnn can give you this kind of a photograph which you see over here okay now the point is that this has a very low mean square error if you do a pixel by pixel mean square error uh, calculation then it is very low but if i ask you this question that does it look like the photograph of a real house in any real city it is no i mean it's some sort of a scratchy thing which looks very different from the sketch but then it clearly is not something which looks very closer to a real photograph and what that would mean is that uh, your perception loss is very low uh, very high loss means something which is low is good and high means it is very bad because you are losing out most of the time now instead of that if i give you this kind of an example that one of these manifestations one of the cnns is able to give you this kind of a photograph see if you want to do a pixel by pixel matching without registration and transformation then it will have a very high mean square error but if you look into the perception loss yes this looks very likely to be a photograph and very likely to be a photograph of that particular that particular uh, uh house itself because you see this kind of a curved roof you see a chimney you see a porch you see a door everything is more or less matching down with the attributes of this house itself so how do you really get this one because as humans we can tell but then my mean square error is the only mathematics which i know for understanding uh, loss functions then how do i really do it so now the point is one way which we solve it is using a another neural network whose job is to learn and learn what it's it's supposed to learn a loss function now what this loss function will do is you cannot directly give it a mathematical form of loss function to learn so that it makes it complicated so here we play an interesting game so what we say is we create this neural network whose job is to say 
when i give it a pair of images which one is a real photograph versus which one is a pair uh, a, a fake photograph and what i do is i always give a pair in which i flip the order randomly between the real and the fake over there so that it can actually learn to discriminate when it's given a pair over there so this is like that spot the difference quiz which you play on newspapers eventually this neural network will learn to understand and spot a fake from a real what we do is we ask this sketch to photo cnn to understand what is the loss function of this how good is this discriminator in performing so if this discriminator becomes very accurate the loss of the discriminator is very low then we say that to the sketch to photo cnn saying that see that discriminator is able to actually identify every single thing which you are popping out from your side because that's the fake which is coming so you are essentially not able to generate something which looks very real and realistic so you will have to start fooling the discriminator now if the sketch to photo cnn has to fool the discriminator it will do some sort of weight updates and model updates and everything the moment it does all of those model updates it will start generating something which looks like a photograph because the only way you can fool the discriminator the only way this sketch to photo cnn can fool the discriminator is when it starts generating images which looks very much like the real photograph so that's what it is going to do and that's the way in which we actually get these kind of perception losses so this whole thing is what is called as adversarial learning and one of those examples was what i showed you in the first particular uh, opening slide and the quiz which we did over there so without that it's it's not at all possible to do it so that's where we are today so today we are using neural networks in order to create cost functions in order to train neural networks people are using neural networks in order to ascertain that a neural network has been trained people are using neural networks in order to define what should be the architecture and structure of a neural network or what we also call as a neural architecture search so it's it's going crazily in a very different world today now if you look into the whole field how it has progressed so somewhere like way in the 1940s and around that time what we had was very plain and simple tool based ai so what this says is what you today have in your air conditioning machines so if you set your nominal temperature at 25 degree centigrade if the temperature goes below 23 degree centigrade switch off the compressor if once the compressor is switched off but you are over there so the room starts heating if the temperature goes above 27 degree centigrade switch on the compressor and wait till the temperature goes below 23 degree centigrade this is what it does so it basically senses a parameter does a rule on top of it and and does it now from there we came down to something where we had uh, like learned decision on top of handcrafted features so a decision learning system in in very classic terms is uh, something uh, which you have with this say fuzzy logic controllers so sometimes in our acs or in your washing machine or somewhere you would see something which is uh, called as uh, climate control so what this climate control does is that if it is humid then you need a different kind of a room temperature if it is uh, dry then you need a different kind of a room temperature so and then plus like whatever is the ambient outside temperature your internal room temperature also has to be calibrated according to that so these are things which which have to be essentially be done so that's like multiple features taken together and then it calibrates you so it keeps on asking you like when are you feeling comfortable and based on when you say that you are comfortable it's going to say that this is working out good over there now from there we came on to the age of what is called as uh, representation learning so here what we were doing is we don't even know what are the core features we take in a certain set of inputs from there we derive out features from there we learn decisions and then we do the final output so these are things which you would do with uh, what today we have in say uh, compression engines for video so here like uh, in this microsoft teams whatever we are doing it uses hvc in order to do it okay so for hvc to work and in fact like if you have downloaded the app and are running it on your uh, recent generation of laptops then most of them have an hvc codec engine in hardware and the hardware app can actually invoke it so if you are doing it from a browser then the browser cannot invoke the hvc uh codec engine and that's the reason why you see a jittery in audio quality or even a lag in video and drop in video all of these things happening because it's trying to solve it on the browser side which is not that efficient way of doing it out so these are pros and cons <laughs> back and forth of how it does my general experience has been that uh, chrome uh, google meet uses a very different encoding it it uses a different compression standard called as webp webp is something which is browser solvable it's a and webp is actually a deep neural network derived uh compression engine that's that's the fun part of it it's 
one generation ahead of uh, HEVC itself. So these kind of things are what what come down in representation learning. In fact, uh, uh, you might be aware of discrete cosine transform based uh, JPEG compression engines, and they use it, or DWT based uh, JPEG 2K compression engines, and they use these kind of representation learnings to do it. Because which particular coefficients you are going to take is dependent on which particular image you are uh, encoding over there, and it's learnt on the fly. From there, we come on to this whole age of what is called as deep learning today where you are not just learning features, but you learn deeper abstractions and much more fine grained abstractions of those features as well. And from there you come down to your decision, which you learn and take a final decision. And then this whole thing is done in a one shot manner. So essentially you look into what is the performance or the error in the output from there. You keep on updating every single model and everything is trained in, in the whole uh, process where it goes down. So if you look into the ecosystem standpoint, then deep learning essentially forms a much smaller subset of representation learning, which is a subset of machine learning, which itself is a subset of the whole field of AI. So if you are just working on deep learning, then you are not an exponent on AI. You, you just know only one single part, but then if you really know AI, then it's anticipated that you know it till the extent of deep learning itself. And this is, this is the interesting part which goes on. Now, uh, we'll start with this first part on what is the fundamental challenge with learnability from available data. Now, the first question which we had uh, started with was essentially to solve this Bayes equation, and there we need to have uh, a way of estimating posterior probability given likelihood, prior, and your evidence. And this was a question which I was asking that given this kind of a distribution, are you really able to do it? Now, one First thing, if we start with this one, is that uh, I can count how many classes are there. The first and foremost is we know what are the classes present. So omega zero is the class indicator variable for cows, and omega one is the class indicator variable for cars. Okay, great. And I also know how many cows and how many cars are present, or what is called as the cardinality of a given class. So there are seven cows and four cars which are present over here. From there. I can find out essentially what is the prior probability of finding a cow or prior probability of finding a car, which is over here. Okay. Now I will be using these uh, bold representations whenever I have a set. So just remember. So P of omega, where P is in bold, is essentially a set of uh, capital P of omega, which is uh, capital P of omega zero and capital P of omega one, which is what I write down. So what is the prior probability of getting my cow class and what is the prior probability of getting my car class over here? Now from there, the next part. So one part of the problem is solved. You have got your prior probabilities. We should be happy. The next part is that I need to get my likelihood. So let me ask you this question. How do you think we can get, get our likelihood from here? I just give you this data set. How do you get your likelihood? from here. You can write on the chat. I got a dot. Yeah, from this plot, how do you think you can you can get it? Ideas. Okay, so here comes this whole part of histograms. In fact, like that, the hint was given over there. <laughs> Nobody looked into it. Okay, so the point is something like this: that I can divide this into certain ranges. Okay, which is what you also called as bins. But then I have two different features, so I will have to divide each of them. 
So first I will divide feature x1 into bin, then I will divide feature x2 into bin. So each of them becomes a square bin. So x1 is within a certain lower range to a higher range and x2 is within a lower range to a higher range. You can count and get it. So if I do this one and I can have a matrix representation, then it looks something like this. So uh, wherever there is a like object which spans across two different because of just the size of it, then I am taking it belonging to uniquely as one of them, not, not giving some sort of a fuzzy association with multiple over here. It's just for simply simply city over here. You can you can actually give something like a fuzzy association saying like 0.5 here and 0.5 in the other one. That's also pretty much possible. So here, now that I have this kind of a point coming down that I can have a histogram created. From this histogram, I can go down and create a probability distribution or, or this is what will uh, become a probability mass function. Not a function, but a probability mass, uh, which I will have from here. Now see, this is about what all things can occur together. So this is something which is going to give me the evidence. This is not going to give me the likelihood. Okay. Now, if I break it down and do it only for my cow class in a similar exercise, I will be able to get my likelihood for my cow class. In particular, one area, more values are often. So how to plot values? So that's what I'm saying. So if my thing is spread across two or more bins over there, I just assign it to any one of the bins. That's what I'm doing over here. You can have fuzzy distribution rules and fuzzy association rules also created. That's also well and fine. It will also work out. Now, similarly, I repeat the same thing and do it for my car class. And now I get my likelihood for my car. What you would essentially also see is that from your evidence, you would see that this kind of an equation is also valid. So which is like essentially if I just calculate my likelihood and priors, from my likelihood and prior, I should also be able to get down evidence without having to hard calculate evidence as well. So this is a provable thing. You can just do it numerically. You will be able to prove. You can do it analytical proof. You can do algebraic proof, probabilistic proof. Any of these proofs will prove this one very straightforward. Now, if I give you this position where I have marked a cross and ask you to find out what is my posterior probability of getting a cow or a cat. So probability of getting a cow becomes zero by putting in all the values from the previous matrix over here. Probability of getting a car becomes one. And in fact, you did see that there was a car present over there. Great, I'm happy around this. Now I give you this particular position, another point. The interesting thing is that we had not actually evidenced anything occurring over there. So neither was there a cow, nor was there a car. So now your product of likelihood and prior becomes zero, which is the numerator, which is becoming zero in both the cases. Plus, since nothing had occurred, so your evidence is also becoming zero in both the classes. And then it becomes a zero divided by zero. Now, you guys pretty much say that if a number is tending to, if a number x is tending towards zero and you divide any finite number by that x, then the resultant is something which tends towards infinity. But if both the numbers are zero or they are tending towards zero at the same rate, you don't know. You really don't have any way of, of telling what will come out over there because it's undefined. So a zero by zero is an undefined problem because nothing divided by nothing. You seriously don't know what is left out as a residue over there. So here comes this whole issue that how will I solve it out? Because this is a region. I did not get an evidence in my experiment, but that does that mean that I will never be occurring any such cow or car? Because is this a condition something like the sun will never rise on the west? Now, in order to solve it out, what we do is, and that's that's a issue with the limited uh, resource problem, limited examples. What we do is we make use of something which is called as a multivariate normal distribution. So here, the whole concept is that you use a distribution model in order to come down with an approximate value of the likelihood over there, given that you have your experimental data from other points. If I put all of these into this set of multivariate normal distribution, I might be able to come up with this kind of a likelihood. So likelihood of getting a car, uh, likelihood of getting a cow over there becomes 6 by 14. And likelihood of getting a car over there becomes 1 by 14. Or, or the other way around, sorry. Omega 0 was uh, uh, car and omega 1 was cow. So now essentially I'm getting these two probabilities. So from here, what I will be able to get down is that my posterior probability of omega zero class is going to be higher than my posterior probability of omega one. And that solves me out. So though it does not get an exactly zero or one partition, but at least it gives me a majority and a minority 
pass over that and that should be good enough for me to solve it out so that's what we do when we have less amount of data available and in fact the whole part of machine learning whatever you end up doing is that you will have scarce point of data and you cannot directly apply bayes rule in order to solve it there will be a lot of approximations you end up doing over here and one of those approximations when you do with a neural network is actually to solve these kind of probabilistic equation problems where we might not be estimating only pieces of it but the whole equation in in total so from there coming down to a very interesting question uh, it has been long that i have been speaking so let me ask this question over here so how many of you know this guy have you seen this guy's photograph somewhere earlier i can give you a simple example if you are on your uh, laptop or somewhere take your mobile phone maybe take a snap of this one and do a google image search <laughs> or if you are on your mobile phone then you take a screenshot and upload that and do a google image search nobody wants to make an attempt i i gave you so many interesting hints if you are on your laptop and you are able to see this photograph then take an image and do a google image search and find it out and that works because i had tried it Yes, I got one particular answer. <laughs> yeah, so so why do you think uh, I might have got up his name over here, and why would I be showing his photograph? no you got some part of it but the i i can say that your last name is wrong the answer which i got <laughs> the first first name is right the last name is gone <laughs> yes 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 So now, any idea why I might have been showing his uh, photograph? And others are really thinking, what is happening over here? Why is a history quiz going on between a machine learning class? But then there are historical significances. Had not been for these kind of people, we wouldn't have been over here at this advanced stages in machine learning in any way. so is is best known for something which you call as a pearson uh, product moment correlation coefficient and in fact like uh, if you remember the pearson's correlation coefficient or what we call as pearson's product moment correlation coefficient then that was the early start of any sort of predictive analytics and uh, this this whole early start was where there used to be a field called as applied statistics which was the birth of machine learning itself so today whatever we do is essentially applied mathematics applied statistics kind of a thing and uh, along with a lot of engineering so most of my job goes in the engineering of how do you implement equations but not actually developing these equations in any way and and this guy was a pioneer of that the interesting point is that most of his work he was uh, uh, doing while he was sitting over here itself and and that's where uh, 
from it started so i got to deep deeper and dive into it when i was a student and, and a lot of credit goes to professor ray so he used to have a lot of weird questions and then once you start visiting the library and then find it out you get down a lot of uh, interesting facts and answers and, and then uh, i did find out that uh, his contribution was phenomenal and not just that um, the interesting part is that he is actually uh, from a place which is uh, barely about 20 odd kilometers 20 30 odd kilometers from the place where this college is located so it is 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 that close by and uh, he brought in a lot of revolutionary things over here and in fact uh, a lot of applied studies with uh, analytics is what we have today was had not been for him india wouldn't have even seen so one of them is like uh, the whole whole programs around say library sciences or around uh, anthropology or even social anthropology where you use a lot of statistics in order to find out what are social derivatives is is what he was contributing to so that was a small uh, pep talk and then to get you relieved but then we are also running around uh, at the verge of ending up our time and then also a lot of uh, uncertainty around in decisions so uh, another important factor which we need to really look into is uh, what is contributed by the whole effort of shannon and uh, he came up with this whole interesting concept on what is called as information and um, relating it to something which is called as entropy or uncertainty so he says that uh, guaranteed events or the say events like sun rises on the east and does not have any information sun rises on the west has a uh, very high uh, information and uh, you would see that uh, so if i say that uh, it's going to snow today in in kharagpur where i am located then that's a very less likely information uh, i mean at the verge of that it's an uncertain information but i cannot rule out uh, snowing as well so that is something which will have a very high information over there okay plus from there uh, you express this uh, in a mathematical form with respect to the probability and all the probabilities which you got down in the previous case can be directly mapped on to getting this information now from there if i get into it so for this particular problem you can see that uh, for every single kind of a task so if it is uh, in terms of uh, finding the prior probability of the classes then you can also have information of the classes and from there you can have entropy of the classes itself so from information i get down to my entropy of the classes over here which comes up now um, what you would see is interestingly that you will be able to get down uh, information from evidence as well now if you look into that then at places where there is no evidence of something happening that has a infinite information because it tends towards uh, that that log thing tends towards zero so it gets you an infinity information and the interesting part is that although it's an infinity information but your entropy is not infinite because your entropy again multiplies that information with uh, your probability and a value which tends towards infinity multiplied by a value which is exactly zero will get you zero that's also well known so that's the reason how your uh, information may be tending towards infinity but your entropy is still going to be finite and in fact entropy is always finite that's the the fun part of it okay so if i look into that then i will be able to get this whole point of entropy for every class itself omega 0 omega 1 or my cows and cars separately over there now what what it essentially brings me is like one part is that looking at just information and entropy you will be able to decipher a lot of things in fact one of the things is we said like we need to have very well distributed data if it is sparse then it will not work or if it is skewed towards one class then it doesn't work out in fact that is something which you can derive from your uh, part on entropy is as well the reason is that if it is very well distributed you would see that it will always hit the maximum point so as an example let me tell you that if you have two classes the only time entropy is going to be maximum is when each of them is equi probable which is each of them has a probability of half and half that is when when it will be the best uh, condition which it will achieve so similarly you can do your maximum minima derivative uh, equations in order to find it out and you will find it but then, that is not all there are in fact a lot of many more things which we do because we end up coming to some sort of loss functions or uh, measures and metrics in probability space which also derive their root from uh, entropy and information itself so one of them is pullback liebler divergence which you see over here 
the other is Jensen channel and divergence. And in fact, if you look into pullback Leibler and Jensen channel, then you would see that Jensen channel can be derived from pullback Leibler. Plus, you would also see that uh, if you substitute Q and P as distributions and just reverse them, Jensen channel does not change, whereas pullback Leibler will change. So there was this uh, interesting thing which um, it used to be a joke in school. I remember. I guess uh, most of you might have also done. I, I, like this joke was there in my fa father's time as well. I remember. So the distance between your uh, Kanpur and Nagpur is smaller than distance between your Nagpur to Kanpur. That, that was the kind of a distance. Or, or in geography class, it was like if you are just following the sun, then the time it would take for the sun to go from east to west, and the time it would take from the sun to go from the west to east is is very different over there. So pullback library is something of that sort, whereas Jensen channel is not that. It's a it's a true distance metric. Plus, there is another interesting thing which we come into uh, from information theory is what is called as cross entropy. And it's really, really important because from here you can understand whether two factors are related with each other or not. And the whole reason why I was drawing uh, Anil Kumar Gayan and uh, his work on Pearson product moment correlation was to bring you down to this whole part that all of that work was an early precursor which set stage to cross entropy itself getting. Uh, developed as a metric without which it wouldn't. And today, if you look into uh, any of the perception loss modeling which we do, cross entropy is the only thing which solves it out. Without cross entropy, there is no loss function to train a discriminated neural network and nothing works out. So, had not it been for that guy way back in 1950s to invent uh, Pearson product moment correlation and then really propagate too much in India, it wouldn't have happened on one side. The other side is definitely if we wouldn't have started this education revolution over here uh, in this district, uh, it wouldn't have possibly been that that Kolakat Engineering College would have come up uh, in a very conducive environment, and we would have so many people really deep diving into maths of all of this uh, today. So uh, this is just a proof of what I mentioned around that true metric and not a true metric. Now, from there, I get you on to uh, another interesting aspect, which is uh, on uh, multilinear algebra. So you have heard about linear algebra, which is with arrays and matrices and everything. The thing changes to multilinear when uh, you don't have scalar elements in every single point over there. So every entry on a matrix can itself be a vector or it can be a matrix. It can be a tensor or anything. So what we call that as is a generalized tensor. And, and that's from where it gets down this whole name of multilinear uh, tensor algebra. And that's how our deep learning frameworks are today built up. So then uh, if you look into it, so typically if you have a scalar, then you write it like this. If you have a vector, which is generally a 1D array of scalars, you write it like this. You can have a matrix which will be made out of uh, some term combinations. And then you have tensors, which uh, are, can also be arranged into what is called as multi-channel kind of a thing. So. If uh, every element in a matrix is essentially a vector, then what you can do is you can span it across the z direction and then you can have three matrices created out over there, which together will be called as a tensor. And then you have these kind of standard operations which are pretty much valid uh, on any of these things as well. So there are a lot of things which you see as similar to linear algebra and there are a lot of new things which come on, but the whole framework can generalize itself to suit down the basic assumptions of 2D linear algebra. And then it is scalable even beyond that for multiple dimensions and uh, multiple uh, dimensions of each constituent element itself. Plus, uh, you have these very basic operations like uh, cross product uh, or, or uh, matrix product, uh, like Hadamard product or dot product. Uh, the distributive property on these matrix operations also holds. The associative property when you are doing dot product also holds. Uh, transpose property holds your inverse of a matrix also holds uh, in all of these cases and these are uh, some of these very fundamental operations which we need so in fact if you look into that you know that these are things which you have already done in your plus two level mathematics there's nothing great going down over here and that's the only thing which we need uh, for what we do today in deep learning uh, there are certain attributes which we look into one of them is uh, uh, this this uh, norm of a matrix, then we have something which is called as the trace of a matrix and uh, they are also inter interesting attributes which we make use uh, often now and then to work it out. Now, if you get into the building blocks, then you would see that uh, a very simple neuron and I, I will be really deep diving very fast through this part because 
there will be detailed lecture which will be covering on each and every point of it and professor a was also introducing something on that somebody wanted to look into slides and images uh, which were not present with him but uh, let me try to do a justice uh, in aiding that confusion uh, getting cleared over here so say i have three different features for one single sample over there and i want to come down to one single output which is called as p hat then what i can do in a simple neural net is i can add some weights over there get them like x1 uh, into w1 plus x2 into w2 plus x3 into w3 plus some additional term called as w0 over there and get an output called as one which looks something like this and this can also be written down as a matrix multiplication in itself now this y can go down through some sort of a, a scalar function called as a nonlinearity and these nonlinearities can have these different kind of forms the first one is what is called a sigmoid which is range limited between 0 and 1 the second one which is called as and hyperbolic which is range limited between minus 1 and plus 1 and then you get your final output which is p hat now if you go from that very simple neuron to a neural network then what changes is that uh, it, it just does not indicate only one single output over that but then uh, you can have a set of outputs which can come down and as a result of it you will not just have one single uh, set of equation but you will have a lot many more uh, uh, different set of equations now if i go down to a generalized format then what will happen is that i will get down a group set of equations and these all matrices i can further group it and write down as um, a rectangular matrix which is i concatenate along the rows and then then that becomes a rectangular matrix and that will also have a matrix operation in fact now you would see that what is traditionally known as a network or what you would also call as a graph essentially becomes a matrix multiplication operation and nothing beyond it that's very simple and straightforward to work it out now from there we come on to another very basic operation which is called as convolution so typically in convolution uh, what happens most of you know it from the very basic understanding of signals and systems and systems theory but here for images what we do is because you have three channels r g b corresponding to each of the three colors so essentially your convolution kernel also has to be a three channel kernel and then uh, you convolve it over this whole image you would end up getting a matrix of uh, this particular form similarly you take another convolution kernel you convolve it you will get another matrix so now in this output matrix or output tensor what we call as you will have two channels in that tensor each channel corresponding to one single kernel convolution kernel uh, and the x and y sizes or the rows and columns is something which is guided by like this now this is for a generic plain simple convolution now there is a thing which we call as stride or stride is what is the pace at which you work so essentially if you are not shifting um uh, your convolutions by one single element but you are shifting by multiple elements then the size of the output matrix changes so say that i am shifting it by a stride of sw and sh along the w and h directions then i would end up having a matrix which looks of this particular size okay it's very standard to prove uh, i am not getting into detail proof of all of this you can actually get uh, a padding also that so that you can take care of the boundary conditions otherwise like you are never able to get down that corner so if i'm padding it down with extra zero elements then uh, my output can be obtained like this so it was something very straightforward from the previous one because when you pad with uh, pw elements on the left and right then your m becomes m plus 2 pw similarly the other one becomes and the rest of the equation remains the same uh, as it keeps on going there another common operation which you would encounter is what is called as pooling uh, so pooling concept is uh, you take a group of values and then represent it by only one single value over there so a very common term is what is called as uh, max pooling so if i want to do that one then you would see that the maximum value in each of them is what is marked in uh, red and bolded so your max pooling operation is going to get you something look, which looks like this similarly you can do something called as an average pooling and the average pooling is something which is going to look like this rounded to the nearest integer of course now from there you can have pooling with strides so instead of doing it for like whatever was the size so i was doing a 2 cross 2 pooling and i was shifting by two elements every time instead of that i am now shifting by one one element so if i do that kind of an operation then i would see that my output size is going to be pretty different and this is something which is again similar to what we had done for the convolution operation itself and the, your max pooling is going to get you uh this kind of a value which comes out over here you can run your average pooling and everything and in fact this max pooling which you see over here is something similar to what you would have uh, typically in your uh, image processing 
uh, known as a uh, dilation operation so and your minimum pulling or getting the minimum value is what is known as your erosion operation in image processing grayscale dilation and grayscale erosion so these are again something which you have already studied most of you already know it and it's very common place term it, they are not things which came up with deep neural networks in any way there are things of unpooling which what it essentially means is that i have a smaller size matrix i want to go to a bigger size but then it becomes problematic so one way is like uh, you substitute the same value everywhere and uh, that way is one way to solve it but then you know that <laughs> you will not have that kind of a granularity present over there so uh, there are different ways of doing it there are uh, unpooling index passing uh, based mechanisms and as well and i, I know that in uh, other classes on deep learning which you will have you will get into a deeper dive of it so then the reason of doing all of this was that we need to understand really about computation and space and and that's one of the key aspects over here because until you understand about what is the complexity of a model in terms of how much space it will take you don't know whether your computer is going to be able to code it and uh, how much time it will take to run it so that's a particular thing which i am very interested and in. that that is which forms my own interest areas itself is to assess computational complexity during training and testing of uh, different algorithms so here uh, this is how you would end up getting the computational complexity for a single layer which is just n number of neurons connected to k number of neurons and each of them present with a bias as well and and how you essentially derive plus each of these uh, weights over here will have to be assigned a certain number of bytes so either you are giving as float 32 which means 32 bits of floating point number or float 64 is 64 bits of floating point number then it will take different amount of space over there or if you are doing as 8 bit integers then it's a different amount of space it takes similarly when you are operating on this one you are not just storing the weights but you also need space to store uh, the inputs you also need space to store the output you also need space to store all the gradients which is what you do on a back propagation when you train a neural network so that everything is going to be related and in fact your space for the gradient is the same as space for the weight because every weight has a update uh, equation associated with it so this is what essentially it comes out uh, on on your output and uh, the reason for having 2n and 2k over here is um, n uh, comes down twice because you have these gradients to be propagated to the previous layer and and you need that gradient on top of n as well so so that is from where it comes from so once you derive further you will be able to get into this one it's not so complicated to derive it out now if you look into the compute complexity you would see that it basic operations are basically multiply and add in in some cases we might be having logical operations in some cases we might have some square root operations as well but here we are looking at uh, multiply and add kind of operations and so essentially my number of operations becomes 2nk so if i have 100 neurons connecting to 10 neurons i have 200 of 2000 operations if i have 4096 connecting to 1000 i have uh, 8 million operations over here so these are not linearly scaling up so you need to understand how much time will it take which will essentially what will come from here when you look into a total model over here then uh, for for cnns it it becomes even more complicated because your number of weights are quite distributed and divided to do it so similarly if you look into the operational space complexity you will be able to find it out and and derive it out and from there we can also get into the compute complexity which can be derived much more similar to what we had in the uh, fully connected neural network but then you can pretty easily see that uh, as we keep on changing how it keeps on increasing over there now uh, this was just a smaller part to explain like we have a standard network called as vgg network and then if you want to look into the compute complexity then uh, you need to derive it from the parameter space over here i will be making the slides available in fact i will show you other links from where you can go and uh, uh, read further to get down detailed understanding so one of the ways of doing it is uh, if you are beginner to this one then uh, my suggestion is to go by this particular book on deep learning by goodfellow benjo and uh, aaron kurgil uh, so then uh, a lot makes sense if you are starting uh, from simon hickins fundamental primary book on neural networks and learning machines uh, which makes it much more easier before you deep dive into deep learning part of it and if you want to get really clear about the linear algebra part uh, and understand how these mathematics work out then uh, work out with gilbert strang's linear algebra for uh, learning with uh, learning from data that that's really a wonderful book to work on and uh, 
finally, like if you want to find what is new on the field, then these are places which you should visit. A lot of conferences are where the new stuff comes in. Uh, journals are at much more mature, but you would get much deeper understanding of what's happening on the field uh, when you go through these journals. And uh, finally, that brings me to the end. And if you want to look more into details of it, then uh, I have a course on deep learning for visual computing, which is on NPTEL this semester. And uh, I think they are still accepting uh, registrations because the start date has been delayed. Uh, I have another one on uh, medical image analysis. If somebody is interested on that, you can look into it. But uh, furthermore, if you want to have something like which is more uh, mature and more concrete and something like <laughs> At, at a graduate curriculum at IIT, a bit tougher and mathematically more richer, then uh, my suggestion would be that uh, my whole uh, uh, semester classroom for uh, deep learning foundations and applications has been recorded for this particular semester. So you can go and search for that. So DLFA or AI 61002 is what you search on YouTube and you should be able to find the whole series over there. In fact, I did walk through very fast on these particular contents. So you would need some way of uh, revising. And then this is one of the ways uh, which you can look into revising. Plus it has the course materials and everything I made available. So you can uh, pull up practice exercises and practice them uh, on your side as well. Yeah, so that's the name of the books and uh, I come to an end. So uh, now I'm open to taking questions. If uh, you're still in the mood to throw questions and not pretty hungry. Any questions? Anything? So, I think for uh, new uh, questions coming up. So we will end the session here and uh, for all the participants, we will wait for the next session. And thank you, sir, for your very much information which you have given in your uh, in your lecture about uh, what are the areas where uh, the applications of uh, the AI is. Thank you, sir. OK, thank you all. See you then. Bye bye. Okay. So we will join 22 for next session. So our next session is uh, sharply on 2 p.m. We will be starting. So uh, all the uh, all the participants should join uh, before 2 or at sharp. Two also. So before two, uh, everybody should join. Hello. Hello. Uh, yes. 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 Sir, do we need to use the same link for joining again? Yes, same link for second session also. Okay. 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 Okay.
day watch link we will share okay sir uh, today evening we will send the second link for uh, tomorrow's tomorrow. okay sir thank you and i will request all the participants please log in with your name those are uh, those have already logged in as uh, unknown users uh, see it will be a issue uh, to give your attendance so those who have uh, already joined as a unknown users uh, please log out and log in again with your name 